Hello, everyone, and welcome to Art of Citizenry podcast, where we navigate the complexities of doing good in an unequal world. I am your host and in-house educator, Manpreet Kaur Kalra. ordered a chai tea latte or purchased a jacket marketed as a kimono? When it comes to mobilizing for an anti-racist economy, it is important to first address the ways in which we reinforce systems of oppression in our everyday life. During this episode, we explore at what point cultural appreciation becomes appropriation. I had the opportunity to host this conversation earlier this month in collaboration with Chicago Fair Trade, New York City Fair Trade Coalition, and Iowa City Fair Trade Coalition. I'm excited to bring it to you now through this special episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for the accompanying slides. In the social impact world, may it be fair trade home goods or sustainable fashion, cultural appropriation often furthers the very hegemonies brands, organizations, and consumers are seeking to address. This episode explores ways in which we appropriate cultures and communities and what we can do to address the problematic impact of appropriation, especially in the fair trade and social impact space. Before we dive in, I want to welcome everyone to this conversation. From the social entrepreneurs out there to the fair trade advocates, thank you for taking the time to have these important conversations. With that, let's get started. In recent months, the term anti-racist has been circulating around the internet and in conversations quite a bit. When we talk about mobilizing for an anti-racist economy, we need to first take a pause and first understand what racism actually is. The way I define racism is that racism is a prejudice against someone based on race when those prejudices are reinforced by systems of power. What's so key when it comes to racism is recognizing the fact that power dynamics are part and parcel to the way we talk and think about racism. So what does it mean to be anti-racist? Anti-racism is about the active process, about identifying and eliminating racism in systems policies, and attitudes. We need to recognize that we do navigate in a very unequal world. We each have our unique advantages and disadvantages. And so when we are navigating through that inequity, uh, it's important to recognize that there are systems that are in place that actually allow for that inequity to um, continue to foster and grow. So when I was going through and prepping for this presentation, I spoke to my dear friend, Catherine, from Chicago Fair Trade. And one of the things she brought to my attention was uh, the fact that one of the guiding principles for fair trade is respect cultural identity. So I did some digging and I went on to the website for the Fair Trade Federation um, to actually get a little more context around what that means. And so let me read it to you, and then we'll go ahead and dive deeper and really evaluate what that means and how it plays out. Fair trade celebrates the cultural diversity of communities while seeking to create positive and equitable change. Members respect the development of products, practices, and organizational models based on indigenous traditions and techniques to sustain cultures and revitalize traditions. 
members balance market needs with producers' cultural heritage? What we need to realize is when we are saying that businesses are the ones who have to decide if we are balancing the needs of a market and a producer's heritage, we're giving too much credit to the business and saying that they actually understand the nuance of a tradition or community. The sentiment here and the intention is really good, right? Like there's no, there's no questioning the intention of this statement. But I do think that in some ways, as we start peeling down and really taking that anti-racist mindset, we realize how in some ways it almost allows for us to appropriate um, traditional art forms that may have been used for very sacred purposes and may have been used um, and co-opted by power dynamics that exist in those countries as well. It's written in a way that is designed to promote appreciation of cultures and identities. But when you go under the surface and try to interpret the actual statements, you realize that it does open the doors for appropriation. So the issue that I see here is often in the name of uh, sustaining cultures and revitalizing traditions or preserving traditional art forms, many brands and businesses are able to get away with actually appropriating cultures and uh, designs that might have spiritual significance. Ijeoma Oluo said it the best in her book, So You Want to Talk About Race, when she said that any attempts of the dominant culture to borrow from marginalized cultures will run the risk of being exploitative and insulting. When we are thinking about cultural appropriation, we need to recognize that we are navigating an unequal world, which means that at the core, there will always be um, a dominant culture and a marginalized culture. And until we can say that everyone is receiving equal levels of respect, we will always run the risk of exploiting when we are, quote unquote, borrowing or being inspired by cultures that have been traditionally and continue to be marginalized communities. We cannot approach this conversation around cultural appropriation without first accepting and acknowledging that there are particular power dynamics at play. When it comes to cultural appropriation, it comes down truly to power and profit. So appropriation at its core as a result is really a manifestation of colonial power dynamics, right? So we um, have to recognize Uh, that when we say we're going into countries of the global south and working with local artisans to create these beautiful products, we cannot reject the fact that part of the reason those communities are really struggling economically is because of colonization. We have to recognize our role in uh, why these communities do need to look into selling into the international market because their domestic market really has no appreciation for maybe that traditional craft form because of the influence of colonization. Colonization exists in so many different forms. For us to think that colonization is just something of the past is naive. Colonization exists in the way that we are navigating as a society in who gets privilege and power. Those are all manifestations of colonization and appropriation continues to build on those power dynamics. There's this idea of designers being kind of the new age um, missionaries. And I know that that is a statement that might really offend some of you, but I want you to let that resonate because there is a certain mentality of, I'm going to go into this community and I am going to try to learn as much about them and then use their traditional art forms and sell it into the Western market, which has more power. We have to realize that there is power there, um, that there is a certain level of um, understanding that for some reason we need to make sure that in order for those communities to succeed at saving their traditional art forms, they have to sell to who were previously their colonizers. 
So what exactly is cultural appropriation? Cultural appropriation is at its core the adoption or exploitation of a historically marginalized culture by a dominant culture. And this, again, remember, feeds into that power dynamics. It's built on the idea of cherry picking what you like about another culture and making it your own, leading to exotification. Oftentimes, these communities that have been marginalized um, were thought of as people who just don't get it. They're um, savages. Our culture is more superior than theirs, and we don't necessarily recognize their culture or their identities. We have to realize that oftentimes the reason that appropriation is truly so problematic is that there are cultural stereotypes often associated with those exact items, objects, experiences that are being appropriated. And that a person that would be in that culture would be judged and put in a box if they were to lean into their culture. But if someone from outside that community is leaning into the culture, they are thought of as worldly, a global citizen. When a dominant culture is wearing or basically stealing parts of an, a, a marginalized culture, you are able to experience those aspects without facing the stereotypes that a person of that culture would experience. For example, if I was to show up into my office with henna on, a co-worker would potentially look at me and say, oh my gosh, were you at a wedding this weekend? Whose wedding was it? Oh my gosh, I love your henna. It's so beautiful. That's so cute. That's so pretty. I love that part of your culture. Oh my gosh, I really want to get henna myself. I've had that happen. I was actually very concerned about getting henna done at my own wedding because I just did not want to deal with all the, the unnecessary conversation that came with it. Now, let's take a white person who is wearing henna and shows up in the office. The question is not going to be about the preconceived notions that you're putting that person in around their culture and identity. It'll be more like, oh my gosh, that's so pretty. What street fair did you get that at? We need to recognize that power dynamics means that People of a dominant culture can wear things that I really have to think twice about wearing um, because for them, they don't have to navigate through a lot of those stereotypes that I would have to. On that note, let me tell you a little bit about a personal anecdote in which I've seen appropriation of my own community and my community's identity play out in mainstream media. So a few years ago, Gucci decided to have a fashion show in which um, some of their models were wearing turbans. I am a person who practices the Sikh faith. The turban in our religion is very sacred. Now, when 9-11 happened, many Sikh men were actually killed in hate crimes um, as a result of wearing a turban. And so to me, as a Sikh person, seeing Gucci now almost making turbans of fashion icon, it takes away that, his, A, it's sacred, it's religious, um, but it also takes away all of the historical oppression that our community has received as a result of wearing a turban. You know, we've been shot and killed as a result of wearing a turban, but now because models are wearing it, we're almost commodifying it. And so when we are thinking about cultural appropriation, we need to also remember that we have to understand significance. And appropriation for designers is really rooted in understanding historical significance and how a community might have been targeted for the same piece that you now are reclaiming as um, a fashion icon, right? So we have to recognize those aspects. Otherwise, we're neglecting and erasing that community's identity as a whole. So when it comes to appropriation, I want to explore three different aspects in which appropriation often comes out. The first one being language. Words matter. Namaste was, um, is one of the things that I think I 
uh, over the years have found really interesting about how it's been appropriated in so many ways. And it's, I think, one of the most iconic examples of language um, appropriation. Uh, and Namaste became something that was very popular, um, especially as a result of the yoga uh, movement. And it's actually taken a life of its own. And the reason I like using Namaste as an example is also because I myself had ha have had people um, greet me at conferences by just looking at me and looking at the color of my skin with Namaste. Namaste actually has no cultural or religious significance to me personally. Namaste is a Sanskriti word. Its origins and the way that it was used actually um, had a lot of religious and um, uh, spiritual significance. But it's kind of been co-opted um, by the yoga movement and has almost been wrapped in this cloak of whiteness. Um, there's a great article uh, that was put out by Code Switch from NPR about Namaste in particular. And um, the thing that I think that in that article that really stood out to me is this idea that when English speakers, especially white English speakers, um, use words from other languages, it almost makes them seem really cultured and worldly. However, if I was to go up and be talking in my mother tongue with my mom in a grocery store, people would assume that I don't speak English. And I, I think that it's important to recognize that cultural appropriation has a lot of loaded context on who the consumer is of the product or the term or the identity or the uh, symbol. Uh, this card is um, a, an example from a fair trade business and it has namaste and an om symbol. Oftentimes people, especially working in fair trade, say to me that, well, we're not appropriating the culture because we're actually creating the product in the community that identifies with that textile or with that term or that uh, technique or um, a symbol. But this card was actually not made even in India. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing is that the intention is to feed into the appropriation of Namaste, right? So it's feeding on and monetizing a term that has become super popular. And I think that's where it's important to recognize who's profiting. The people who probably um, still resonate with, the, have some sort of, sort of spiritual connection with the word namaste, have no profit from this card. Okay, so we have to recognize that it's not just about power, but it's also about who is profiting at the end of the day. And if you are using another culture just to profit off of things that have become really in vogue of that culture, that is problematic. Um, my journey with fair trade actually started with an obsession with a art form that is native to the land that my ancestors are from, the land of Punjab. Punjab is now divided in between India and Pakistan as a result of colonization. Fulkari is the art form that I wanted to explore. And so my journey with fair trade actually started when I decided to go to India for two months and just learn the historical experience of Fulkari, meet artisans who are keeping Fulkari alive, and actually even learn how to do Fulkari myself. At the time when I was planning this trip, I learned that at the Philly Art Museum, there was a huge display of uh, Fulgaris from pre-partitions. And so I decided I wanted to go and uh, look at the Fulgaris. And the Fulgaris were gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. The thing that bothered me though, is that the Philly Art Museum um, was displaying this collection, um, which was actually owned by a white couple in the United States. At the time, I didn't maybe blink an eye on it, 
until I actually went to Punjab and learned about Fulkadi. And let me take a moment to tell you a little bit about it. So Fulkadi is a form of embroidery and it was actually done as a gift for when a daughter was born. So when a daughter was born into a household, all the women of the family would do create this beautiful um, chunni or basically um, scarf that would be over the years continue to be broidered um, and then gift it to the girl, the daughter, when she is married. And so the Fulkadi has a huge spiritual or cultural significance in the Punjabi community. And over the years, it's been very much commodified, right? So it's the Western, it's been picked up by fashion designers, the Western market, and it's been very much commodified to the point where now it's very rare that you find people who actually do Fulkadi in the way that it's meant to be done in Punjab itself. The one thing I will say is that it is a protected um, form of textile. So if you want to call something Fulkadi, it has to be made in Punjab. And then recently I saw in my Instagram feed um, someone who is working actually with artisans in Punjab to create garments that have Fulkari motifs on them. The issue, however, is that um, this person's um, project, the Fulkari project, completely rejects a lot of the um, historical context, but B is being used for profit, right? So you're taking something that has a lot of cultural and spiritual significance to a community and making it um, part of your uh, modern, you're modernizing it and you're trying to make it, uh, you're taking away from that spirituality and that significance that something like this would have to a person like me. So A, I have a lot of issues with this image. Um, I realize that this is a small operation. So I believe the model is probably the person who's creating the product line, but I do think that it is problematic for a variety of reasons. Um, and especially because it's erasing in many ways, the historical context, significance and people um, that are, that find, that are very connected to Fulgati in itself. You know, one of the things I often say in my ethical storytelling lesson is one of those core questions when you're creating your brand narrative is, Am I promoting cultural hegemony? Cultural hegemony being dominance. In many ways, oftentimes designers are hegemonic. They are dominating a culture, basically cherry picking what they like about it, taking it and then reintroducing it. And so this example that I'm sharing, many would say, well, she's at least recognizing where the art form is from. She's recognizing what the art form is. She's celebrating the technique. But I would say truly, um, if you want to celebrate a technique like this, work with a designer that has that connection to that community and really work with them, collaborate with them and elevate their work because that's their community and that's their significance. And it may even be that they don't feel that it is appropriate to be taking it into the mass market where most people who wear the product won't necessarily know its significance. Fashion has um, historically been a result of cultural appropriation. So now let's talk a little bit about um, another really hot button piece um, in fashion, the kimono. Okay, so this was, um, I think that the kimono in general has become uh, synonymous with cultural appropriation when it comes to fashion. It has been, I, I went on um, Anthropology's website uh, when I was working on this deck and they had 81 results for when I searched kimono. I can guarantee you that they are using kimono purely as a way to identify the product not actually recognize the historical context behind the kimono and its cultural significance. And one of the things I think is really important to recognize here is this, this idea of the kimono really does link back to what we were talking about earlier, is you can take things from another culture um, and cultural appropriation as a, at its core is the idea of not having to deal with the stereotypes that that community might have faced um, as a result of wearing or appreciating that same uh, item or that same piece. One of the things that um, Emmy Ito mentions in her article is that we need to realize that um, people have been racially targeted 
uh, for being Japanese and wearing their own cultural garments. Why are, do we feel that we need to take something that's sacred to a community and monetize it, right? Like who is profiting? That community is not the one that's profiting. You are. And you're basically taking something that is sacred to them and making it your own. So now let's talk about um, the last form of cultural appropriation that I want to make sure that we touch on is symbols, right? So taking traditional symbols, sacred items, and turning them into profitable items or movements for a community that isn't the one it originates in. And the first one I could think of when I was working on this was the Guatemalan worry dolls, right? So I, um, I went to anthropology again, and I searched worry doll, and lo and behold, they had a worry doll on their website. The description, which is the one in the box, actually completely erases the culture and origin of the worry doll in itself. The other example is actually an example from a fair trade organization. I would say this is still problematic. And the reason I will say it is still problematic is that um, in the description, it says Guatemalan legend. And actually, it's um, Mayan traditions is where the worry doll originates from. The thing sometimes that we that leads to cultural appropriation is oversimplification, right? When we try to oversimplify a culture or a community, we end up actually appropriating it. And what it does is it actually disregards the fact that even within domestic communities, there are there is forms of appropriation that do exist. The Mayan community is actually a marginalized community in Guatemala. I think it's important to recognize that appropriation can be domestic. Say we're going to a country other than our own, and there is an art form that we want to celebrate or that we want to use or that we want to learn more about. That art form may have actually been co-opted by the dominant community in that country as well. We need to use it, look internally to recognize that we do this ourselves, right? We have appropriated Native Americans. We have appropriated Black culture. Um, and we need to recognize that if this, it's not just an issue in the United States where, where we have a historical, um, we have history of appropriating marginalized communities in our own country, but even in the global South, in those countries as well, there is marginal, there are marginalized communities and there are power dynamics there of communities who have power, but communities that do not. I think that the big thing is when we're talking about appreciation, we need to recognize what is the significance, right? So many textiles and items um, contain cultural or spiritual significance. Uh, if you don't know what that significance is, please just the best way is to appreciate and just enjoy it from afar. Don't buy it. Don't source it. Don't wear it. If there's something that you really, really love, get to know what it means. Get to know its significance. For brands, I think that there's three significant checkpoints. It's about understanding sourcing, the significance, and similarity, right? So when you're sourcing, is the community you are appreciating one that is still affected by historical oppression or ongoing discrimination? I do think it's okay to um, source traditional techniques if they are credited, explained, and if you are deciding that you're going to actually um, pay them fair wages. This comes with a caveat, right? So I think that there's something where we have to recognize that when we are designing and creating, if there is, again, the next point, significance, right? So if there is significance to that cultural aspect, um, there's meaning, if there's sacred, you should not be using it. And then finally, similarity. When similarity is this idea of basically copying someone's work and making it your own, right? Without any acknowledgement of the community or culture that that piece of work originates from. This comes down to reframing who is the designer, right? Oftentimes, I think this is one of the things where when we talk about decolonizing design or decolonizing fashion, we have to really ask who is the designer. We often think of uh, the people who uh, the art form or the textile, the communities that it originates from, we call them just makers and artisans. But we don't actually think of them as the designers. We don't give them that credit that this is their design. They are the designers. 
And when you actually reframe who is the designer and elevate the community and the culture that the design is originated from or the technique is originated from and collaborate with people in that community, that's how you can start decolonizing design and really appreciating it. And finally, I think it's important to recognize that context matters, right? You can appreciate a culture without capitalizing on it. Um, Not everything has to be for the gram. So one of the things that I think, um, one of the questions I've gotten in the past uh, and another personal anecdote. So when I got married, I had um, a sick wedding and I wore traditional uh, Indian outfits and I had friends from all walks of life who attended. Some of them bought themselves traditional Indian outfits uh, that they could wear at the wedding. And I loved it. It made me so happy. To me, it was them giving me respect and then also appreciating my culture. The issue would happen if my friends decided to take those outfits and wear them outside of the context in which they are appreciating and experience. If my friend uh, decided to wear her um, Indian suit uh, to just like a regular work party, that would be problematic. That is cultural appropriation. But she actually ended up attending another Indian wedding and wearing it there. And then they loved that she was wearing that outfit as well. So context at the end of the day matters, right? So I think that there's something about um, also oftentimes there's photos when you are doing your artisan trips that you might take. Not every one of those photos needs to be on Instagram. There's some photos that you can have that are just in the moment of you being there and appreciating and exchanging cultures. But when you start doing it for the likes, for any form of monetization, monetization doesn't necessarily have to be money. It can also be likes. It can come in the uh, form of social currency. Any form of monetization, that's when you're crossing the line and falling from appreciation to appropriation. And that's where I think cultural humility at the end of the day is so critical. Cultural humility, as many of you have probably heard in my previous presentations, is this idea of pushing um, us to challenge assumptions. It's about putting our ego aside and really wanting to learn from a community or a culture about the nuance of their traditions, right? Recognizing that we will never have a complete understanding of that community or culture because we do not belong to it. We do not navigate in it. And as it does not matter how many years you spend in a community or culture, you could have lived in that country for 10 years. You will never actually understand what it means to be a person who is born, raised, and continues to live in that community and navigate through the nuance of that community. Because again, Again, we each have our own advantages and disadvantages, and it all just comes down to a mutual exchange of appreciation. With that, I want to thank all of the listeners for tuning in to today's episode and extend a special thank you to my dear friends at Chicago Fair Trade, New York City Fair Trade Coalition, and Iowa City Fair Trade Coalition for supporting my work and making this happen. My favorite part of hosting these conversations is, of course, the discussion. So if you're interested, please keep listening for the webinar Q&A led by Zachary Rochester as an added bonus. But before that, a few reminders. To learn more about artist citizenry and for information on future webinars and workshops like this one, please visit artistcitizenry.com. You can also find me on Instagram at Manpreet Kalra. Please remember to subscribe to Art of Citizenry podcast on your favorite listening app. From here in Seattle, sending positive and healthy vibes your way. resources around crafting inclusive narratives and how to address many um, factors around 
anti-racism in your brand, organization, social enterprise, uh, it's worth checking out this page on my website. It's called um, Inclusive Narratives. So the website URL is artofcitizenry.com slash inclusive dash narratives. Um, and also, please feel free to reach out to me. I know that this is a really loaded topic and it takes some time to soak in. And so if you have questions, I, I do recommend please reach out to me. My email address is here and I'm happy to work with you and address any of your questions, um, so forth. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Manfred. Um, I've been really excited about this series. Each time we do this, I'm getting more excited about stuff because there's just so many intersections and we are casting such a large web of showing where all this stuff is interconnected. And um, I really want to recommend to everybody too that article that um, Manpreet mentioned from Code Switch about Namaste, because um, I mean, this stuff like cultural appropriation is so specifically tangible. Um, and so is colonization in the yoga studio and in yoga spaces. Um, and so that one that's really dear to my heart is someone who really, you know, tries to dig into the text and actually understand what it is that I'm practicing because it is such a potent um, practice. So anyway, thank you. And that was my <laughs> caveat there. But um, we do have some questions in the Q&A. And then after I read these two off, we'll open it up to everybody else too. And we'll unmute. Um, you guys can raise your hand in the little participants tab. And then we'll unmute you and let you ask your question. So the first one is from... Um, Jessica Moreno and Jessica said, can we define more the term profit because it can mean different things? I think there's a balance between greedy profit and profit to enable you to function as a business whilst paying a fair price to the makers of origin. Yeah. So I think profit is, um, yes, definitely. There's multiple layers to profit, right? And I think that what we have to recognize is that um, when I say profit, I also think that there's something to be said about the many forms of currency that exist, right? So it's not just financial profit. It's also, uh, there's this idea of feel like feeling good is also profit, right? There is multiple layers to profiting. And so, yes, there, I agree that you need to be able to be financially sustainable to employ artisans, um, or makers or designers in the communities and cultures that you're working with. However, with that said, I think that it's also worth recognizing that, um, if if you are uh, essentially using their uh, cultural identity to market and to um, create your product and create a space for your product, that is a form of cultural appropriation and we need to recognize that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Anjali Bar. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, can you please touch on food and the rampant cultural appropriation in the food industry? Um, really good question. Really good question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what uh, I guess I, I would love to know what about food um, to touch upon, but yes. I see this all the time. Um, I see this with Indian food. I uh, I had a colleague one day, um, a white male s s colleague that came into the office and was wearing a shirt that said, "I I live for lessies," and lessies are a traditional drink from um, Punjab in India, and I just was like, oh, lovely. And like chai, right? Like we see this with um, chai in general, like Starbucks has his chai lattes. And like my husband and I joke about this all the time is chai at its core is meant to be kind of a latte, right? Like it's made with milk. So like latte in itself feels like it's like double meaning. Um, but yes, in the food culture, there's definitely a lot of appropriation that happens. Um, and I, I do recognize that. And I, I think it's important to acknowledge. Uh, how, I don't have the answers of how do you not do it. Uh, but I think that part of it is like, it, I see it, right? I see it. I don't have a good answer. Um, but yes, I recognize it. 
I, I, if you have a particular question about appropriation in the food, food culture, I would love to hear it. Um, but yes, I acknowledge it. Okay, next, Veronica has asked, um, I have experienced that we women artisans in a highly touristic place will change their designs or offer certain designs that are more appreciated for the tourists in order to make a sale. What would be a way to navigate this issue with the women? For them to not give in what the general tourist is looking for and somehow be able to teach um, or defend their authentic craft. Yeah, I mean, this is a very classic, like classic example in most um, tourist centric economies, right? Tourism is a form of, um, of is it has become a huge driving source of income for many communities. And the issue that I think we need to realize is the power dynamics there, right? So we have to acknowledge that there is a certain level of power dynamics in this feeling that, okay, if um, we, we, are ha we are feel obligated to give you only what you want in order to make sure that we are that you will you will appreciate us or that you will buy from us and i think that one of those things is that when you start like this comes with um, any brand that wants to be more thoughtful about the language they're using as well. But the way that you start shifting it is by also shifting and changing what you give, right? So like part of the things is tourists are not going to buy something um, or not going to want something if they don't know it exists, right? So actually shifting the way that you sell and give telling them that you should feel like if there are spiritual items or textiles that have some sort of spiritual significance, please do not sell it to the tourists because they may not respect it, right? Like this happens with um, even, uh, like I, I've seen this with Fulgati, right? Like I've seen it with Fulgati where it has cultural significance to many people from Punjab, but it's become available in these tourist markets. And then people have them, they'll have keychains with Fulgati on it. They'll have scarves with Fulgati on it. But actually, you know, my favorite example is I went to a hotel room for my, I checked into my hotel room for a friend's wedding. And uh, this was in um, New Hampshire. And the pillows were Fulgati print pillows. Like they had Fulgati embroidery on them. And I was like, no way, this, there's no way that this is happening. And the reality is people don't know that. So let's talk a little bit again about the tourist market space, right? So this is where we have to recognize that many of the artisans um, and makers and designers really do want to be able to make some income right? Like that is, that is, we have to recognize that that is reasonable, but we should also encourage them to try to create those income sources or sell products that maybe don't have as much um, personal cultural significance to them. So uh, that is a hard balance. And that is, we have, that is a certain level of power dynamic. And the onus is not just on them, but also on the people who are buying. If you don't have a understanding of the cultural significance, and in some ways, you, this is where you have to do your research. Um, because you you, they may say like, no, no, you know, like this is for buying, like this is fine, but you have to do your research and recognize that um, it's, we are navigating with our own advantages. And if we are buying something that we don't fully understand the magnitude of um, significance of, then it's probably not our, we should not be buying that. We can buy something else. We can buy something that maybe we can't, that we can use as a memento from our trip and appreciate their, their identity as well. Um, maybe more of a comment than a question, but see what, if you feel like responding or what you'd like to respond to. So mentioning on food, this is from anonymous attendee. Um, food is very specific to small regions. Not all Indians eat the same food and not all Africans eat fufu, which I think is a good point, realizing that there's those complexities within regions, like you mentioned earlier, too, with the power dynamics. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and then Christine from Fairtrade USA 
um, commented, what are your thoughts about celebrating and acknowledging religious and cultural holidays outside of our own Christian holidays? Um, I've seen a lot of brands start to celebrate holidays like Diwali and um, Holi. Is there a right way of acknowledging these days on social media? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So <laughs> this is a really, I love this question. This is a very great question. Um, and I think it really comes down to context. Right. So um, oftentimes I think that the context is what's often lost. Um, and so for it, for brands that decide that they want to celebrate religious holidays, we need to recognize that that is not necessarily the, a religious holiday that is not um a Christian holiday. Um, I think that it's worth recognizing a few things, right? Like I personally don't do it. I, um, because I, I have very mixed feelings on it. So I think that oftentimes it's on in the execution. So oftentimes the execution of that celebration can be oversimplification of a holiday without recognition of the whole context and the reason that the, that 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 holiday is significant to the community. Diwali, for an example, is a Hindu holiday. It is not a holiday that's celebrated by Indian Muslims. It's not a holiday that's celebrated by Sikhs in India. Um, and it is a Hindu holiday. And now, if that is a holiday that is very closely intertwined to the identity of the groups that you are working with, um, I think that it's okay to acknowledge it. It's just about the execution of how you acknowledge it. And I think that um, religious holidays in general can be um, super problematic and even national holidays, right? Like I've seen a brand that recently was posting about um, like the 4th of July, like Independence, Indian Independence Day. And Indian Independence Day, as a, as a person from Punjab um, and from a region that was divided during Indian Independence, I have a lot of strong negative emotions tied to it because that was the day that my community basically got shifted from one side of the country to another and lost all their land, right? So there's a lot, it's, I think that what's important is when you do decide that you want to celebrate a holiday, you have to first do your research and understand like what is the actual, is this a loaded holiday? Is there context around it that we need to recognize? Because that context can actually really influence um, how that, the way you actually celebrate it is perceived. Um, so I do, I think that that's important uh, when it comes to something like the Bali and so forth. Um, it really is about recognizing the context and not oversimplifying and sharing the fact that this is a holiday that is uh, really close, near and dear to your, the people who are, you are celebrating and that you are elevating through your work. But that also means having diversity at every level of your business. So if your diversity is only the artisans that you're working with, that is an issue. That is power dynamics. And then I almost feel like that is profiting off of their culture. And that is not okay. Okay, we have two pretty meaty questions. <laughs> so that might that might bring us to our end of our time, to be honest. I'm not sure. But they're both really good. Um, okay. so Anjali um, says, how can I help companies understand the offensiveness and damage or dilution of culture that, reserve, that results from them selling white made chai, for example, that is, made, that is called masala chai, but resem resembles nothing of what you would find on the subcontinent and has ingredients that are totally inauthentic and misrepresent and redefine the item in question. Um, I literally get eye rolls and brush offs when I bring it up. Oh, yeah. Oh, Anjali, we should talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I get this all the time. I, um, I'm currently visiting my family in California. And, um, you know, it's funny. I, like, it, Starbucks does this, right? Like, I'm going to use Starbucks. Even small, like, um, super, I'm in Seattle. And, like, most of the coffee shops in Seattle will have, like, a chai. And my husband, like, doesn't drink coffee. So he'll order the chai. And he's, like, always very, very um, underwhelmed and really 
uh, there's so, yes, so much appro appropriation that happens. How do you address it? Um, I have resorted to relationship building. I think building relationships is key to this, right? So oftentimes, um, I think that it's really important to have conversations with those brands um, directly, right? Sometimes as consumers, we do brush it off because it's not our problem. But I will say that many brands, it's important to take the time and to actually uh, build that relationship, reach out to them, email them. Um, and if you're still not getting the response that you're expecting, this is where I think that um, some forms of activism become really powerful, right? So like, we need to recognize that yes, chai is a great example of appropriation. Um, yes, there are masalas in the chai uh, mixes that are out there um, that are just not accurate. Um, but I think that w one of the things that you can do is start by really reaching out to the brand. And there's many people who have brands and work at companies that are creating products. And I can say that many of the people I've spoken to and I've built a relationship um, have been very open to hearing and listening and to reconsidering, right? And I think that it's really about reaching out to them and explaining why you feel that what they might be selling or the way they might be selling it needs to change. I know a friend of mine who um, was talking to me um, and mentioned how someone had reached out to her about the naming of a product and they had an amazing, very educational conversation and it made her rethink how she names that product. So brands, I think, are not, at the end of the day, brands are, there are humans behind them. And so building those relationships and talking to them and explaining your critique is important. <clears throat> That's why we're doing this series. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jessica. Um, this is where it gets very complex and almost feels slightly paralyzing as a designer with good intentions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to work with anything sacred and have expressed this from the outset as I completely agree with respecting the origins. However, then if we work to create something more neutral here on a purely visual aesthetic level, we are erasing the historical context, as you say, or promoting the foreign eye or taste as superior, or rather that the artisan's taste is not right for you to sell to your market. And she said, this creates very conflicting feelings for me. In the chat, I said that that feeling of inner conflict is a great place to be at because this is the point that everybody, we're trying to get everybody to be at right now because that means you're getting somewhere. Yeah. But, no, that's exactly right. Like being at that point of uh, inner conflict is so, so important. And I agree with you, Zach. And I think that to the point of, um, I, I'm sorry, I missed the name, um, uh, but the person's comment, right? This is where at the end when I was talking about reframing who is the designer becomes really important, right? So like, it's about language. Language is so critical. When we, we often as a um, society, have really um, failed to recognize the power of language and the words we use. And we should really reconsider that. And so reframing who the designer is and actually even as a designer yourself, collaborating with designers in that community who understand the nuance of culture and this, its significance becomes a great way to actually not just learn, but uh, also elevate the art and the community themselves, right? Like we've seen this with recently with Black Lives Matter, right? Like when we were talking about Black Lives Matter, one of the beautiful things that came out of it is elevating Black voices, right? And one of the things that I think that kind of pulling from that um, sentiment, the same thing applies to uh, design, is elevating those designers and working with them and collaborating with them because you as an outsider do not know the significance of that culture or that community and you will only know so much, right? So even if as a fair trade brand, you know, like I see this at times um, show up in 
The reason oftentimes that cultural appropriation happens is that you don't have a diversity of representation in your design process. And so improving that diversity of representation and design process will actually help you understand the nuance of the product that you might be creating um, with the community that you are working in. And so um, a few things, right? So like working with the local designers, elevating their art form, um, and then also um, really thinking about how you uh, engage others who are from that community in your design process is important because that's when, you know, like there's always those posts that you see from um, organizations and you're like, how can you be so tone deaf? Like why, how did this get past your PR team? Right. And I think usually the reason that happens is there's not enough diversity in experience and voices at the table when making decisions. And I know that as an independent designer and as a small business, it's really hard. You know, you oftentimes can be a one um, person show and that's reasonable. Um, but I think that's when um, you have to make that active decision of really bringing others in from those communities. Um, that's what prevents you from having um, beautiful um, items with motifs of that culture, like a Om symbol or a Taj Mahal um, or like a golden temple, right? Like all of those are symbols of that community. When you have used those symbols as motifs, that's when it's problematic. Right. And usually if you have a diversity of voices at the table, you'll be able to catch those issues early on. I really love that. Yeah. Like trying to do everything that you can on a, along every step to just get rid of all those blind spots that of course you're going to have. And that's not, yeah. the, you know, that's not the fault. It's getting yeah. rid of the blind spot by bringing in more eyes. <laughs> exactly. Eyes, Yeah. And the correct experiences. And huh. you know, we all have blind spots. And I think that was one of the things I wanted to recognize is, you know, I, I know that I'm speaking to all of you today. And I want to recognize that in this situation, I'm holding a certain level of power of information, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean I don't have my own blind spots. Um, and I also want to recognize that oftentimes when we talk about cultural appropriation, I do use white people as examples. That doesn't mean that white people are the only ones that appropriate cultures, right? And that was one of the things that I mentioned on um appropriation can be domestic as well. So if you were to go to India, people in power in India who are not white um, will also appropriate the marginalized communities there. Um, even in the United States, right? Like there is a brown woman who has um, a late night show um, named Lily Singh. And we actually belong to like the same um, uh, cultural, uh, ethnic community. But she has, and I very much disagree with this, she has notoriously um, uh, appropriated Black culture, right? Like, she does, she is a brown woman who does cornrows. Like, that is problematic, right? So it's not to say that the only people who appropriate other cultures are white people, but I do think that we have to recognize that that is the major ethnic majority. So oftentimes it is important to have those conversations. Okay, we've gotten a couple more questions and we're at 125, so I'll just pick through a couple. Um, I'll just kind of tie two questions in here because they're a little bit related. So you've mentioned a couple times, maybe throughout here already, you did it at the beginning of um, someone being like, okay, so where can we find an example of someone that is doing a good job of the appreciation instead of the appropriation, which um, I know you have a, a good <laughs> stick on, on that question specifically. Um, but the other question was, um, for example, from Starbucks. So what is the response that you would want from Starbucks in terms of like chai? So should they not sell chai or should they call it something different or sell chai and give an explanation of its origins and use authentic products that are sourced properly? Yeah. Um, or is this about acknowledging the conflict or so yeah. So is this about acknowledging the conflict or changing what people are selling? Um, I would say changing the name. That would be, to me, the solution. Um, it, it should not be called chai latte. Uh, it is, uh, it need, the name needs to change. It's kind of like how kimonos, right? Like there, there 
has been hopefully and continues to be a shift away from using the word kimono to describe anything that has flowy arms. Um, <laughs> and so similarly with chai, anything that's just a tea latte um, is what it is um, with some spices that are not exactly chai-ish. Spicy latte. Um, spicy latte. Yeah, spicy latte, uh, spicy tea latte, exactly. Like it, it just, I think to me in the Starbucks example, changing the name, right? And I think this is, I would say that for even local co coffee shops, like do not call it chai. Um, my mom, um, this is really funny, right? Like I think this is where there's a nuance on cultural appropriation that we have to recognize, right? Like there is, and I was telling someone this is, um, there, so my parents, for example, um, immigrated to the United States like 30 years ago. Um, and for them, when they see a, um, a white person wearing an Indian outfit, it gives them a lot of joy, right? Like they love it. They're like, oh my gosh, look, they're wearing an Indian outfit. They look so beautiful. Um, but I think that that's part of what the nuance with appropriation is, right? It's this recognition that um, we need to realize that if we continue to normalize that behavior, it can actually create more issues where it is then taking away the significance of that experience. Um, and so we have to realize that there is nuance. Not everyone is going to be like, oh my gosh, you should have done that in any community because not every community has the same perspective. Not every individual thinks the same, but we have to also then recognize that we as people of a dominant culture or people in power, um, <clears throat> have to know, but have our own mental checkpoints. And so that's one of those things that I think is important to recognize. Um, and then, yeah, I think that to the point about um, positive examples, I would say that positive examples are brands when they are properly crediting, when they are paying um, fairly, and they are recognizing the art form and staying away from for art forms that might have some spiritual or cultural significance. Um, I think that doing it right also entails representation um, in your models that are showcasing the products from those communities, right? I think doing it right means that having um, a certain level of uh, staying away from oversimplifying someone's culture. Uh, and so really being able to um, create that, um, that certain level of, uh, that certain level of appreciation entails really not oversimplifying and recognizing historical context. <clears throat> okay. So Oh, do you want to do the example I was going to give, I totally forgot. One last example, sorry. So the example I was going to give, and um, this comes from um, Anjali, your comment just reminded me of the original example I started off with. Um, so my mom recently bought a chai mix from Costco. And I, ha I don't remember what's written on the box, but it was basically a like concentrated chai mix um, from that's, uh, that you have to dilute. And she bought it from Costco because she thought that it would be interesting to try. And my husband and I were sitting and reading the box and it basically says something along the lines of, you know, this um, spiritual chai mix is made by a couple. And it was like a white couple in like the middle of somewhere in the US. Um, and it was like totally co-opting the idea of what chai is and it's core, like food in general, like this is ex exactly an example of food being appropriated, right? Like a totally um, misrepresenting the historical context of chai. Um, and they have this chai mix at Costco, like it's concentrated chai mix. And we were looking at it and we're like, this kid, and we tasted it. And I was like, this is not chai. This is like some fusion masala, like over masala concentrated water. Um, and I think that that's the thing. It's this misrepresentation of someone's culture is when appropriation becomes really problematic as well. Um, oh. 
So we're at 1.31. I just typed in the thing asking if everybody wants one more question or if we're ready to pack it up for the day. I think the one thing I'm leaving it with is like, yes, everybody, this is so complex and nuanced and there's a lot of room for um, gray areas and we all have to reflect on what our experience has been, who we know and who we are working with and acting, you know, we're, at the end of the day, we're all going to make our own choices about how we're going to act given all of this information. And you really have to just trust your gut that you're doing, taking all of these pieces in, into consideration and doing your part to not perpetuate these, these cycles that we're talking about. Um, yeah. So he's answered. So maybe we'll go ahead and just uh, call it a day. Yes. <laughs> um, I do want to encourage everyone, like, I know this is a really loaded conversation. So please email me, like find me on Instagram. I'm at Munfreeth Kalra, direct message me, um, email me Munfreeth at art of Um, I'm like very accessible. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I am excited, right? Like this is a, a Catherine, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about continuing this series and I do feel like I, um, I'm excited that we continue this conversation moving forward. I do tend to do more technical talks. And this to me is an example of one of those very technical talks where it talks. Um, so I do appreciate everyone joining this conversation and being on. Um, and I look forward, please keep an eye out for emails and more information and so forth. And yes, thank you for joining this conversation. Yeah. And, and I would add, too, that we will, as we did with the last session, we'll be sending out a survey to all of you. And you'll have a chance there also to, to share more questions. Um, yeah. So yeah. thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. And please, like, if, if you learned something during today's talk that you found to be super valuable, um, share it, right? Like, share it with us, put it on um, Instagram, tag uh, Chicago Fair Trade, tag me, tag, tag Zach, tag like, our, like New York City Fair Trade Coalition. I mean, we want to hear what your thoughts are and we want to keep the conversation going. So I really do appreciate all of you being here today. And stay tuned for more. Yeah. Well, yeah, no. yeah. We're going to keep going. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Thank you.